In a world... Mate, hold up. We said we're done with the serious intros. Who said? Well, we did. I don't remember that. Well, I said it, and you're me, so, you know... Well, I don't care. In a world... Uh, hey, I told you. We're keeping it light. You do it on your own, then. Well, technically, I already am, so... Anyway, fuck yeah, pure wild flight. Get it down, ya. How good? Visit nzaerosports.com. I get to do the next one. Well, obviously, you moron, we both do. I was 19, broke, unemployed, and sold my girlfriend's canopy for drug money. So, I thought I'd better sew her a new one. What a sentence, and what a story. This describes the humble yet outrageous beginnings of NZ Aerosports, the home of Icarus Canopies, in the words of our founder himself. From getting a paratrooper toy from his mom, watching parachutes at the DZ as a six-year-old, jumping off the wharf with a parachute made from bedsheets, doing his first jump at 16, sewing his first canopy on a borrowed machine at 19, and starting to sell parachutes out of a garage in 1986, Paul Gyro Martin had an undying love for the sky. Our company started with one man with the wildest of spirits in a true blue sky dream, a renegade. In the time that Gyro created and ran the Icarus Canopies brand until he passed away in 2017, he pushed everything he had to its limits. We miss him and we always will. Gyro is the next generation of NZ Aerosports. It honors our founder, of course, because it was the name we all knew him by, but Gyro the rebrand also marks the start of a new chapter, our next jump. Gyro is the space between sound and silence, art and science, chaos and calm. Gyro is a state of epic tranquility that transcends understanding. That moment, in the door, in free fall, mid-swoop, where nothing but the present exists. A perfect balance of euphoria and thrill. Gyro captures our passion for flying and our commitment to designing break-the-fucking-rules canopies that deliver pilots pure, wild flight. Coming straight from the cockpit, it's another episode of Lunatic Fringe with the fucking pilot. Ready, set, go! All right, back in the can for another edition of Lunatic Fringe Into the Void. And uh, with the magic of the internet, I've got another amazing person on the other line to give us some insight on all kinds of cool stuff in regards to skydiving and, well, a little bit of everything. So tell me, who the fuck are you and what do you do? Hey, how are you going? Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Attila and um, I'm general manager of NZ Aerosports. Attila with NZ Aerosports. So That's right, yeah. A lot of people just either smiled really big or got cold sweats thinking about the amazing stuff you guys are producing. No, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, so you've got uh, – actually, I don't, I don't want to get too deep into the NZ Aerosports stuff first. I want to hear about you and how you got started in skydiving uh, and, well, basically anything extreme. All right. So my father was also a jumper. Um, he actually stopped jumping before I was born, but he kept um, in contact with his friends. Um, and so I always heard the, the stories growing up, um, and I thought, I'm, not, I'm not, never going to be able to do that. Hmm. And then one day, one of my friends just asked me if I want to go skydiving, and uh, without thinking, I remember I said yes. And that's when it started. I was 16 years old. Nice. But I'm, I'm from Hungary originally, so... Back then, it was a little bit different, um, different type of uh, course and, um, and the gear and everything. Hungary was a communist country. And the first jump course, it took two months. Really? So it's a little bit, <laughs> it's a little bit long. Yeah. And we, the gear was probably about 20 years behind what the rest of the world was jumping. Mm. So my first jump was in round military-style parachute. Um, it was chest mounted reserve canopies. I packed my reserve for the first jump. 
<laughs> wait, of, wait, what? You packed your reserve for the first jump? <laughs> yeah, that was part of the course. Holy yeah, shit. Yeah, we all learned by the time by the time we went for the first jump, we packed it probably like you know, 10, 20 times. Oh, wow. Even better, for the, for the, for the fifth jump, we actually had to open the reserve on the canopy <laughs> and, uh, and land on the two canopies. <laughs> Wait, a two out was a requirement to, for the course. Yeah, for the fifth jump, not for the first. <laughs> oh, all, all the way when you had that much experience. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, like, um, so that was, um, that was my first jump. Um, after the first jump, actually, I wanted to stop. I was just too scared. I wanted to go home. But probably because my dad was a jumper, I thought, okay, I'm going to stay for these eight jumps. And you guys never gonna see me again. <laughs> but um, yeah, by the time I get to there, I just couldn't wait any longer. Was was there a specific jumping was, jumping was free? It was free. Yeah, it was free. So back then, it was free. We didn't have to pay the government. Uh, it was part of government uh, military type of training, but had its downsides because um, we I, I used every opportunity in the first year to go to the drop zone and I managed to do 27 jumps. Oh, wow. So they told, they, you know, they told you when you can go out to jump, which plane you can go up and w what altitude and what are you supposed to do in free fall. Mm. Um, so yeah, it was a little bit different, but um, hey, that's what everybody was doing. It was, um, it was still the same, you know, good bunch of people. Sure. Yeah, I had a time in life. I was 16 years old. It was great. Now, was there, because you said you were really scared when you first got started, was there a turning point? I mean, did, was there one jump where you're like, oh, that was it, I got it, I figured it out, or that wasn't as scary as I thought, or did you just push through because dad used to do it? Um, yeah, at the beginning, I just pushed through. So first day, we did one jump, and the second day, we did two, and I was just, just really drained, you know, emotionally, physically. And I was like, oh, what am I doing here? Like, you know, I wanted to try this. You know, this thing is going to kill me. Mm. And, uh, but then the next day we did three jumps and I don't know, it was just a nice day or, you know, something just clicked. Definitely not the jumping. There was, a, there was, you know, we were just doing um, static line jumps. They opened the door. I seen the light. I was jumping, you know, running to the door and that was it. Right. That was kind of funny. And so, yeah, I don't know. I just, um, now, yeah. what, changed. what was the mentality behind having you guys pack your own reserves and then open it on the fifth jump? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> How can one, you know, back then it was normal. Like, you know, they told me this is what you have to do. There was about 40 new students on the drop zone. Everybody did, did the same thing. So it was, um, it was normal. But oh yeah, only years later I was wondering like, you know, what the hell are we what right? are we doing? Yeah. Now what did dad think of you jumping? Oh he yeah, he supported me. You know, he supported me with everything that I was doing. Um but when uh, when I told him I'm I wanna start jumping, he was really happy and he was really proud and like oh, he just helped me along the way everywhere he could you know, That's... he could. And the funny thing is that, you know, he, he stopped jumping before I was born. Mm. But a couple of years after I started jumping, he came back and he started jumping again. Really? So, like, when we were, like, you know, handing it back and forth. And mm. then my sister, you know, he, she started jumping as well. So, yeah. That's a bit of a family thing. Very cool. So now 16 is really, really young to get started in that as well. So especially if you got started and really got going with it, did you know you wanted to work in the industry like from the beginning? No, like, no, there was no industry in right. Hungary. So there's a lot jumping. So the first, um, the first time when I seen real skydiving, it was a, in 1991. Uh, 1991, the World Championship was in uh, Slovakia and all the, um, the French forward team, they were the world champions at the time, mm. and uh, German forward team and A3 team, they came to Hungary for training because they had a helicopter on the drop zone. And yeah, I was still jumping my uh, chest mounted <laughs> reserve and these guys came with, uh, I think um, the first ZP canopies came out in um, in 91, like you know, Sabre mm. and uh, 
BT, BT Pro or not BT. And you know, these guys were swooping those canopies and I was like, what's going on? Like, you know, there's a totally different level of skydiving. Right. And I think that was the first time when I thought, okay, there is something here that I like to do actually for, uh, I like to learn that. I like to experience that. Mm. Now, what was your first step into the, because uh, you, you, see, you see these first competitions and uh, especially coming from the background that you did, it must have seemed like a whole brand new world. Uh, what was your first dive into trying to get into skydiving working wise? Oh, there was, there was way later. There was, um, um, there was in 95 when I started packing. But before that, I was really lucky because um, as the government changed, the whole skydiving scene changed as well. And there was like, you know, new opportunities. Mm. Um, that's when the first, you know, we could actually compete in four way the first time. And uh, we built a good team with my friends who were like, you know, 20, 25 years old. And because there was no four way team before, we won the nationals straight away second year on the road, uh, second year um on the first second competition oh, wow. we had four way in the national and the government was supporting it so i was 22 years old and i was off to the world meet to arizona in uh in four way wow um first jump first first time jumping outside of hungary and straight away to arizona i mean um that's an awesome drop zone <laughs> yeah i mean and I it had to have yep, been as some some serious culture shock to go straight from you know very small and and very uh, isolated in hungary to to arizona i i didn't want to leave <laughs> i remember at the end of the competition i was jumping i was standing out there and i didn't want to get back into the car i didn't want to leave and um yeah my friend said like oh don't worry like i'll be come back and yeah that's where i started actually packing in um, in 95 or uh, 96 Wow. So yeah, I did back and I, I spent a lot of time in um, in Arizona. It's one of my favorite places actually. So that was the first major competition and your first time jumping ever outside of Hungary was Eloy. Yeah. I mean like oh we were shit on the competition. Yeah. No doubt. Like you know, we I think you know we beat maybe two teams. Um but uh yeah, it was great. Oh, it had to be. And another Another funny thing on um, on um, on the competition there is um, we were on the same plane with the New Zealand team at the time. I didn't speak any English, uh, but the whole the Kiwi team and the Hungarian team uh, we were on the same uh, same plane. So Joro, who became my boss and a good friend of mine later on, um, he was in the Kiwi in the New Zealand forward team. So we were sitting side by side. <laughs> Not no like. You know, but, uh, that we're gonna work together um, years later in New Zealand. Well, it's yeah, it's good. Cr uh, it's crazy how I, I, and it, I've talked about it before on the podcast that the sport to those of us that have been in it for a long time feels like it's been around forever, but skydiving is still really pretty damn new. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. still very young, and and I've been lucky enough to to sit and talk to people that were my, you know, my heroes when I first started skydiving and, and I've been lucky enough to jump with guys like Lou Sanborn. I mean, licensed D one for Christ's sakes, uh, and to be able huh. to jump with someone that's, you know, at the, the you know, one of the, basically the founding members of modern skydiving, uh, and he's still jumping. How epic is that? It's, it's such a great sport in that respect. Yeah. 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 And there was a different sport back then and the gear and, uh, you know, we can thank a lot for those guys. Oh yeah, um, they shaped the uh, the gear and the and the rules and everything for us. Yeah, there were a lot of people that uh, that got the the truly dangerous stuff out of the way. I was lucky enough to have Bill Booth on as well, and some of the stories that he's told just stand the, my hair on. And <laughs> so now you did that first big competition in Arizona, and obviously by then you're completely hooked. So did you keep competing quite a bit? Yeah, that's right. Um, I probably completed competed on eight world meets total. Oh wow! Um, yeah, like most of them uh, in four way for uh, the Hungarian four way team, and then um, three times for the New Zealand four way team. And uh, I also did one uh, canopy piloting world meet in um, in Austria in Vienna in two thousand and six. 
Man, oh man! I mean, you've kind of well, you've seen it all, especially considering you started, you know, on rounds with belly reserves, and to be where you're at now, especially working with, yeah. you know, I mean, do you ever just sit back and shake your head and go, "Holy shit, what a ride!" Um, yeah, you often um, you often forget about that, but yeah, like you know, time to time, like you know, you look back, and um, I tried a lot of things, you know, achieved quite a bit, so. Um, feel good about it um so yeah like uh, just before this podcast i was i was thinking about it that i jumped those gears which was like really like 20 years before our time in the in the 80s i was really gear designed in 60s 70s and i also jumped um one of the first petras it's not the first petra so it was a quite a big of a gap between the two. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's absolutely insane. You, I I don't even think you can compare the two. They're so different. Now, how did you end yeah. up um, going from you know a belly reserve to literally the cutting edge of canopy technology? I mean that's it's astounding, really. Oh yeah, that was um that was a long a long way. Um, so the next thing in uh, scattering for me, like it was the next big change. That, um, you know, there was winter in Hungary, so I couldn't jump. And by then, that's all I wanted to do. You know, I was like 25. And so we went to the States um, to start packing. And we ended up packing for the Golden Knights. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah, yeah, not. And packing for them and traveling with them and jumping with them for years, it was just amazing. You know, there was a, um, yeah, I, I, there was there was a huge step forward for me. Sure. In scattering, I got to know a lot of people in um, on the scene. There's a, where they were jumping. That's where like most of the the teams, like in Arizona, most of the teams from uh, from Europe and the rest of the world were training, um, and we spent the whole, you know, winter there um, for years. So sure. I, love, I love that. And then in '99, um, I went to Arizona for uh, for the World Meet, and I stayed there. But then I was also doing tandems and a little bit of AFF. So I wasn't just packing; I was working on the drop zone, um, and then going back to Hungary, working there, doing tandems. So I was already working in the industry. Sure. And that was that was like oh I was just chasing the summer um, back and forth. Now one year after. No, please uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I wanted to stay in in, in Australia. I, I by then I kind of like you know, I had enough of, um, of of traveling, and I really liked the 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 Aussie skydiving scene. Mm. I had a I had a good job. Um, you know I was jumping in Tugaloa. I love that place. Mm. And I wanted to stay there, but couldn't because of visa. I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't get um, extend my work visa. I had to leave the country in the middle of the winter, and that's when I I uh, came to New Zealand. Um, wow. I didn't want to go back to Europe, so I came to New Zealand. I got a work visa straight away. I got a job, and I was like, okay, I can I can do this here. Um, this is a beautiful country. Oh yeah. And yeah, I've been I've been here since 2002 well new zealand's uh, spectacular i was very lucky in that i had the opportunity to go over and and spend one off season from the states jumping uh, on the beach down in paihia Uh, and it was spectacular i mean such a stunningly beautiful place that's where i was working in the bay of Islands. You were okay, so I followed in your footsteps. Yeah. That was it was amazing. I was jumping yeah. for uh, um, I I don't know if it was your the operation that you were with, or I jumped for Davy and Kelly for for one uh, season. No, there. that was that was before, but I did I did some jumps for them, um, on weekends. But, yeah, uh, yeah, no, it was before that. It was oh, before that. What a spectacular place! Before 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 Aerosports. Before I started working for Aerosports, I was working up in the Bay One and oh. and. Um, I had a bit of a falling over with my uh, with my boss there, and that's when my first son was born. And yeah, I was looking for something something different. But scattering is all I all I knew since I was sixteen years old. Sure. So, um, you know, there was obviously 
I wanted to find a job in skydiving, and I couldn't find a job on a, on another job zone. And I already knew Joro and um and the guys at Aerosports, and I just asked them, hey, um, I have nothing to do. Do are you guys looking for anyone right now? And they said, yeah, actually, we are looking for someone right now. Wow. So I started working there. So I was in, in uh, 2005. Okay. Now I don't I don't know a whole lot of history about NZ Aerosports. Um, I it's it's I remember being surprised because uh, New Zealand didn't really hop on my radar for a long time in regard to skydiving. It had always just been the U.S. manufacturers and all that stuff. How did NZ Aerosports not only get started but become I mean one of the leading canopy companies in the world? Um. So Joro, who is the founder of um, NZ Aerosports, um, he was um, he was a jumper, and he just wanted to make ends meet, and um, you know all he wanted to do is skydive and to finance his um, his jumping. He didn't have a job. Hmm. He started making uh, logbook covers and uh, jumpsuits and uh, gear bags at first, and then. Um, he made a, a parachute for himself, um, and it actually worked. It's um, oh. just a copy. And I mean, then he, he, his friends asked, like, you know, would you make one for me as well? And then so he made a few. And he's a real thinker. Um, you know, he was a he was a real genius. And so he he started thinking, oh, I, I think like you know, I can I could do this a little bit better. So he he started tweaking uh, those canopies. And they actually, they actually, uh, they got better. So yeah. he started making more and more. And that's when he actually, um, in 80, 85, 86, um, Enzo Aerosports was born. And um, and um, he started making Icarus Canopies by Joro. Wow. I mean, the the... The balls, <laughs> that's the only way I can put it. The balls that it has to take to go, yeah, fuck it. I'm going to make my own parachute. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. that's pretty hardcore. And especially to be able to go from yeah. that and do a good enough job that your buddies are like, yeah, could you make me one? That's epic. That's awesome. Yeah. And um, the first, probably the first, like, all big breakthrough, from, uh, you know, he had some good canopies and, mm. uh, you know, people liked it. But... um. You know, PD had the Excalibur, the cross-based canopy um, they made from an F111 uh, uh, fabric. Mm. But then um, the ZP fabric uh, came on the market, and they were actually better than um, than, than the cross-based uh, F111 canopy. So mm. everybody was concentrating on the on the ZP canopies. And that's when Joro was um, thinking that okay, so. The cross base canopy was a better structure than um, than the normal nine cell canopy, and then ZP is better than F111. Why don't we try to put it together? And that's when he made the first um, cross base um, ZP canopy, mm. which he called uh, you know the Mark One Extreme, which was flying great, but it was opening like shit, mm. and he couldn't really like you know, solve the opening for a long time. And I remember he telling told me that. Um, one morning he woke up. He probably went bed. Uh, went to bed. Um, you know, he was drinking a little bit before he went to bed. <laughs> the next morning he woke up and there was this drawing on um, on his bedside table. And then he looked at it. I was like, "Oh, this is a great idea." And that's when he started closing the nodes on um, on the canopy first, mm. and now uh, on the Mark One, and then uh, then on the FX and Crossfire uh, to control the opening. That's the crazy thing, right, is is you don't just have to try and figure out the aerodynamics of a canopy in flight. You have to figure out the aerodynamics of a canopy as it opens, which I never yeah, that's, that's, I never thought about. Yeah, that's um that's um that's that's the art. Yeah, that's for art sure. Part of it. Now, when you started with uh, NZ Aerosports, what were you doing for them? I was making line sets and uh cutting canopies, rigging and very soon I realized how how little I know about canopies and hmm. um and, and how they made and um and the parachutes. And I had so many questions and I wanted to learn everything. Um yeah, it was just, just interesting. Um well, 
So now when you started, uh, um, it wasn't laser cutting canopies and stuff, was it? You guys were hand cutting this stuff, weren't you? No, we actually, so there's, there's something else that, um, that, um, that Joro, uh, did. He, he developed this, um, cutting machine, um, with a friend here in New Zealand, um, cutting the canopy with a hot knife uh, blade. Okay. And he actually sold, he actually sold this cutting machine all around the world. Um, many companies, uh, you know, making parachute had, uh, had this, uh, cutting table. So he started traveling the um, the world and putting in uh, cutting tables for uh, Tony Urigalo. He was making um, canopies at the time. I think he sold the first one uh, for him, mm. and then uh, Precision, um, and he also sold one for uh, Simpson in Spain. And he got to know also people in the industry. And the Aerosports was still a really small. Um, company manufacturing in the garage for France and um, into the Australian market. We had some good ideas and some good products almost de- developed. And then that's when Joro met uh, um, George from Precision and, um, and Fernando from Simsa. Mm. And uh, they formed um, Icarus Canopies and, um, and started um, marketing and pushing the Icarus, um, Icarus brand around the world. So that's when actually the brand and us started growing. Well, and it definitely has. I mean, it, there's there's really only yeah. two. I mean, it's uh, the the different canopies going back and forth that you see in competitions or that everybody's talking about. It's always NZ or it's always Icarus or PD, back and forth and back and forth. Yeah. Oh, and, thank you. We like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, you guys are on the podium all the time these days now. I mean, that must just, you guys must be thrilled with how amazing the canopies aren't just received, but how well they perform. Oh, yeah. That, you know, that's, um, that's, that's the fun part for us is, um, is you know, we design and develop these canopies and, um, you know, we put it out there and just watch what, uh, what, the, what, what the, the scattering family does with the uh, with the canopies like you know they um they changing the sport mm. uh, you 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 make a you make a canopy and um you think okay like oh this is a good uh, good canopy to fly like the cross base canopy back in the days you know the 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 fx and then the velocity and the next thing is um there is a swooping competition or um you know you make a small canopy and then um uh, and then um you see xrw like you know it's a it's a totally new sport and um you know, it's, you can't plan for that. Just, right. uh, you're giving the tools for the, um, for the market and, um, and you know, you watch them go. Yeah, I, I, I honestly, I kind of always imagined that it was you guys would build these canopies and jump them and, and figure out what they're good for to some degree and then get these videos back going, holy shit, they did what with this? Because <laughs> skydivers are always yeah, going to yeah. push and go a little bit further and a little bit more hardcore. And I mean, l- watching guys do, you know, basically ground loops, 360s and XRW and all these crazy things that they're doing with your canopies uh, all the way down to to jumping the smallest canopies ever. I mean, that's some pretty crazy stuff. That's right. Yeah, like you know, some sometimes I'm watching it and it's like, oh, I'm not supposed, I'm not sure, like if you're supposed to do that with this canopy, <laughs> right? But um, yeah, like you know, I love the footage and um, and um, hey, like you know, there have always been uh, people pushing the the the, the sport and um, and showing us how far we can go safely. So. You know, I take my head off for uh, for those people. Sure. You mentioned uh, the you mentioned the smallest canopy. Yes. Um, so that's that's a good um, example. Um, Luigi started that with the um, with the with, with the VX first, and then then the JVX going from forty one to thirty nine and thirty seven <laughs> square feet, and, um, and then later on um, Ernesto. Landing the the thirty five square feet, and we are actually in um, in a process with uh, with Luigi. He wants to take that the record back with the thirty four square feet Slayer. <laughs> I mean, that, that's that's a bed sheet. That's uh, oh, it's I'm um, I'm looking at the panels and it's insane. I mean, like, you know, you you pick up the thing and now uh, and um, yeah. It's, 
scares me, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, visually, I, I see. I was I was lucky enough to be around um, when the thirty five was being jumped, uh, and seeing it in person, and it looked about the same as the kites guys fly on the beach. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's teeny. Well, so what kind of intense design has to go in? Because it's not just a matter of just making it smaller. So much more has got to go into that. I mean, you guys must be putting a ton into it because at the end of the day, it's your name on that canopy that's being flown. Yeah, that's right. And um, and so we have experience with this. Like, you know, this is not actually something that, We've been pushing as, um, as a company. And it was always like a first Luigi approaching us. Hey, I'd like to try this. And we were like, okay, yeah, like how we make it? Obviously, this is also interesting for us. Like mm. this is taking something already extreme into even more extreme. Like, you know, this is, um, this is, um, this is interesting for us. Sure. And yeah, like throughout as, as we made the smaller canopy and the smaller canopy, we always learn something. So now we have a, now we have a checklist of modifications that we have to make on um, on um, on, the, on the line trim and um, and the, um, and the canopy itself. Um, obviously, it takes uh, much longer to make it, and I mean it's a world record. Um, so you can't go smaller and smaller forever. Forever, sure. you know, there's got to be a point when it doesn't work anymore. Right. Um, but like you know, you don't know until. Because you know it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, um, but that's a process. I mean, you know, these are uh, professional athletes, and um, you know, they um, they collect data and video, and you know, they're not just gonna put it up there and sure. um, and see what happens. So they have the whole training plan worked out, and um, they only are gonna do it if they trust that it's actually gonna work. So sure. you know, if you know, we trust them, they trust us. Right, right. One of the things that I found most surprising in watching Ernesto and his training and workups to it uh, was that the most critical part for him um, wasn't the flying or the landing; it was the openings. Cause definitely, it, yeah. I, like, oh, that's, uh, that's that's definitely the scariest part of it. I don't know if you've seen um, any footage of um, of that canopy malfunctioning. Yeah, I have, and I have never seen anything so instantly intense in my life you don't have much time there like you know it's um it's like you know the, the speed and yeah like you know when, when i'm looking at it it's just jesus christ like, well yeah so the the forces involved in the speed with which it happens it's so instantaneous that i i mean reaction time has got to be insane and i mean i watched ernesto put all kinds of hardcore physical training on himself just to be able to handle the stresses because half a turn into a bad opening and he's struggling to get to the handles i mean that's intense yeah, you know, he's like you know, Ernesto, like you know, he really put lots of um, effort and in, uh, into the whole project. It was really nice to 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 watch him through the whole process and um and um and, and working with him. Like, sure. You know, he really now, obviously, with his uh, jumping the 35, that was the most extreme case. But as you guys produce these um, extremely high-performance canopies, these cutting-edge canopies, and these are getting released onto the market, are you guys – is there a nervousness involved into the – the way that the skydivers are going to use it? Because, I mean, let's face it, there's some skydivers that are out there that are super safety conscious and, and can handle that hardcore stuff, but there's also the ones that are just going to, you know, crank and yank and go as hard as they can. When you put out something new, are you ever going, oh, geez, I wonder how this one's going to be? Um, yeah, like, we, like we, we try to put some, um, some rules around of, you know, what – who should be jumping what? Right. And so we're really asking all those details and and sometimes like you know, they, something raises a flag, we we talk to them, we ask around, like you know, see if they have any coach, um, or uh safety officer drop down safety officer we can uh, we can talk to. Mm. So the sales team here really like you know try to do the background check um to make sure that you know, only people are jumping these canopies sure. um, who can actually, you know, lend them, jump them safely. 
but you know you you never know at the end of the day like yeah. you know they can make up um you know it happened with us that uh that the, they made up a whole backstory and someone was you know covering the whole thing and we find out uh, that you know like we wouldn't even sell a cross base canopy for the person and they ended sure. up uh jumping a layer so that's uh <laughs> that's sad but um we hope that uh, most of the time the the skydiving community out on the drop zone will take care of it. So, you know, you try to do your part, but there is also that on the other end, um, you know, people will stand up and um, and say something if, um, if sure. they say something is not right. And this well, usually happens. And at the end of the day, second-hand people... Market, market is also, second-hand market is also a funny one. Like, you know, you don't really have a control over uh, who are they selling canopies to. Sure. And um, you would think that, you know, you really look at the person you're going to sell the, your canopy to, but um, it's not always the case. Yeah, and well, and uh, I mean, at the end of the day, people are going to do what they're going to do. Uh, if someone is bound and determined okay. to get their hands on a Leia, even if they shouldn't be on one, eventually they're going to get a hold of one. It's going to happen. So yeah, that's right. Yeah. There's, there's only so much you can do. Now, does NZR Sports do, uh, do you guys have uh, canopy courses and stuff like that? No, we don't. But um, you know, most of our athletes like you know, they're running um courses and um and but we do chat to 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 PD coaches as well. So, you know, it's not only in or close, you know, circle circle of um of uh, of coaches or friends. Um sure. we know people all around the world, obviously. Um this you know, it's, this is a small community. So yeah. you can always reach out to and the people appreciate that. Yo, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, yeah. I mean, it's it's just the due diligence on everybody's part, and it absolutely should be. Now, um, so how has COVID been treating you guys? And, I mean, I know New Zealand did pretty good uh, all in all and was super good with the lockdown real quick and everything, but uh, um, have you guys gotten back to jumping? Uh, yes. We actually just had another um, – other, um, not full lockdown, but um, um, we went back to level three, which meant that um, you know, lots of companies had to close down, including like our know, drop zones. Mm. We just opened up again. So what we have here in New Zealand is, um, you know, we are lucky, as you said. Um, it's a bit of a good news, bad news situation. Sure. Like now we can open up again and we can operate, but um, we can't really open the the borders. Because um, you know, as soon as we do that, um, we have to close down the whole country again. Sure. The factory is um, is open, and uh, we are operating. The office is um, an admin staff sales team. We are all working from home, um, so there is a bit of a disconnect between. I feel that is a bit, this bit of a disconnect between um, you know production staff and um, and the office. But um, yeah, it's um, it's temporary. Um, it's nice to be back yeah. again uh, soon, hopefully in, yeah. the, in the factory. Obviously, everybody is affected, uh, so we are no uh, different. Um, yeah, I just saw uh, something recently. Um, something about uh, Talpo closing its doors for good. Yeah, they only have a few more weeks. Oh um, man! And they have two. Yeah, like you know that's. Um, that's that's really sad and um and it's it's really heartbreaking to see drop zones um struggling and um some of them closing down and um and I guess um it's not the end of it. Um Yeah, yeah I mean... it's it it is you know, the 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 whole uh tourist you know, the whole scattering um industry here is um is based on on tourist Oh yeah. On on ten and same in um you know, similar in Australia, so you know, no tandems. But um, hey, maybe maybe they will be concentrating more on uh, on student training again, and um, you know, pushing people in lockdown. Maybe thinking about their life and um and their bucket list, and um and uh, maybe this is gonna be some For... um some new people injected into the sport. Um. Well, and I would think in, in some 
In some ways, it might be po- positive uh, in regard to long term and, and getting more active skydivers in because now the money that people were going to be spending on those vacations that they can't take anymore, uh, those people that had that bucket list that, hey, I always wanted to learn how to skydive, but and they didn't just spend that money on the trip to Europe or they didn't just spend that money on the trip to the States. Maybe now they're going to put it back into jumping, which would be amazing. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping for. Um, some of the drop zones we, um, you know, we talked to in um, in Australia, they already dusting off the student rigs and pushing for our students, and um, and because um, there are no tandems. Mm. So yeah, I really hope that um, that is actually happening. It's it definitely sh- so it puts good it for the sport. Be good for everybody. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, all of this definitely put an exclamation point on the fact that the the sport really blossomed and kind of had this huge boom, specifically because of the tandem industry, because we're watching, you know, drop zones kind of going into shock without those tandems. So uh, maybe this push in a new direction and going towards the student stuff will be healthy eventually for everybody, which would be awesome. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping for. Yeah. Now, uh, does uh, uh, is there anything new coming down the pipe, uh, canopy wise? Have you guys got uh, any new designs coming? Any new changes? Yeah. Yes. Um, we're always working on um, on new canopies, um, new new ideas. Um, I guess that's the the interesting part of um of um of our work. Um, we have two projects. It's been on the pipeline for a long time. Um, one is Anna. It um, it um, would be a canopy somewhere between um, you know or JFX and um, and Leia. And the other one is P2, which is uh, Petra 2. Um, huh. Would be Petra on um, on steroid. Jesus. Steroids. Um, I mean, like Petra has been. Um, been been jumping it for like you know eight nine years now so yeah. um you know we we have a lot of experience with uh, with those canopies sure obviously like not being able to to test jump lately um slow down this project a little bit but uh, hopefully we are not too far with those and other canopies yeah like student and the tandem are still two canopies that um, that we didn't renew. So they are due for um, for uh, for some work at one stage. Okay. Um, we don't have a reserve, so there is a reserve is on um, on the drawing table. Oh, nice drawing board. At one stage, and um, yeah, all the things that you learn from all the high performance canopies, um, um, they all trickling down into all the other canopies. Sure. Um, so, no, what do you think we should be working on? Well, the performance of your tandem canopy stuff is fantastic. Um, I've always enjoyed that quite a bit. I don't have the balls to jump the Petras and the Leas just <laughs> a little out of my range. I started jumping a Velocity years ago, and that's as high end as I ever went. Uh, and now these canopies, I watch them come in, uh, and a, a casual landing is just rocket fast compared to what I'm used to. Now, did you do some of the yeah, test jumping same. on all that like, stuff? Oh, I'm jumping. I'm jump. I'm jumping a sapphire now. Yeah, I used to do. I used to do test jumping. So what's it, I mean, what's when, it like um, doing test jumping? When, it, 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 you got to be a little bit. Like, I'm assuming that you have a, a triple canopy rig when you're test jumping something, but I mean, it's got to be not always. But yeah, no. <laughs> I, I just can't no, imagine so, the first guy to jump a, a Petra. Yeah, I mean, like, oh, it didn't just happen um, happen that way. Um, so in 2010, um, we had Julian uh, from France came to visit. Uh, you know, he was in he was in New Zealand working with America's Cup, uh, mm. working on uh, on some sail, um, some wing sails for sailboats. Okay. For America's Cup, and he was a skydiver uh, with few hundred jumps, and he came to to visit the aerosport. We have people coming to the company factory all the time just to look around. So I did, did a normal uh, factory tour with him. And then at the end, he said um, he actually, he think he could help uh, help us with uh, designing canopies. Hmm. And, you know, that was, um, that was different. That was a little bit odd. I didn't know 
well, you know, I couldn't tell if he can or not, if he's bullshitting or uh, or he's he really like you know, if he's he, he for real. Hmm. And but anyway, we kept in touch, and um, and he came back half a year later, um, for a project. He brought his uh, softwares, and um, and we started uh, working by just recreating the JBX um, with his uh, with his software, um, and and then testing the JBX or JVX that we've been jumping for like you know five years, and we had word records with that canopy and his design um oh. compare apple to apple and yeah it was good and then we realized that um that with the with his um software bundle and with his brain and uh, with his method we can actually come up with an idea um run the simulation in the cfd the next day and then in a couple of days we can pull those panels out um, make the canopy, and in a week we can actually jump the canopy. Wow! So we started. Um, that was our um, summer of love um, R and D project, mm. and we started our uh, rapid prototyping. Uh, Joro just wrote down this long list of ideas that that he wanted to try. Starting with, let's make it a higher aspect ratio. Let's make it um, more electricity on the front, more electricity on the back, more electricity you know, around the whole canopy. And always just try one thing at the time. You know, like we, we shape the canopy and then we put it into the CFD. We look at the numbers and the graphs. And if it's looking good, then, um, then let's make it, take it out to the drop zone. Go back to, go back to the factory debriefing cocktails, watch the videos and, you know, pick the next target for the next week. Um, it was a great time. Like, oh, we had really great energy and every canopy we learned something. And uh, some of the stuff I'm looking at it now, it's all on YouTube still. Uh, some of the stuff I'm looking at is like, you know, it's crazy. <laughs> um, and yeah, like oh, we've been just jumping it as a main canopy, uh, most of them, you know, high altitude, High jump, high um, hop and pop, and then give it a good trash up high. And you know, if I felt comfortable to to land it, then uh, landed it. If not, then uh, then cut away. That was um that was the you know that's that's what we've been doing. I mean, that's and intense. Then... <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> it was. Um, but then I started after a while. We started um, experimenting with. Um, with different rib shapes and they look great in the computer. Um, the numbers were just like, you know, 10, 12, 15% uh, um, improvements in, um, in the canopy. Mm. So we definitely wanted to, wanted to give it a go. But so one thing that, that you, the computer, it doesn't tell you is how the canopy is going to open or how is it going to feel um, on your controls, front riser, rear riser, brake lines, and also how stable the canopy will be mm. um, on different teams. And we made the very first canopy with a different uh, wing uh, rib shape, um, just an, um, a JVX platform. That was the canopy we had the most um, experience with. And the canopy was just, um, you touch the front riser and um, and the canopy was collapsing. Ooh. But by then we had this um, this funny um, three canopy system where you had the two main canopy on. Yeah, it was um it was a strange, strange system. Like it was all three canopies on your back, and um, the test canopy. You opened the test canopy first, but you had to cut away putting two handles on the front of your um of your risers hmm. and then after you you release the, that canopy then they then you had two more canopies just your like your normal rig on um on the back and we before julian went back to to europe um we put all our good ideas together into one canopy um and that canopy was just I jumped it. That canopy only have only got one jump. Um, <laughs> we never, we never, we never jumped it again. Um, so 
it was really fast. I jumped it. It was an 86 square feet. We called uh, her Ilona. And I pulled the front riser and the canopy collapsed. And it's inflated again, but it's collapsed again and inflated again. And it just went crazy. It shaked me around so badly that my feet actually ended up in the line. Oh, my God. I don't know how. Um, I, I never heard anything like that right for so the canopy was i was i was flying it for like you know 30 seconds 45 seconds trying some you know like some deep breaks some turns some re a little bit before i touched the front riser and um so yeah now i was uh my my, my right angle was a uh, right anchor was in the um, between the lines <laughs> and upside down spinning around really fast i thought i'm gonna like you know, pass out but i couldn't cut away because we all spin out, and the handles were between my chest and the riser because oh. the, the riser was going towards my leg. Anyway, long story short, um, I couldn't cut away, so I just had to pull the reserve Oof. and hope for the best, which I did, and it's opened. Um, so now the reserve was open, but this canopy was still around my ankle, spinning around, so managed to cut it off and land the reserve, and yeah, like no. We still have the canopy in the graveyard, but um, okay. yeah, never put it <laughs> well, again, in the, it's in the bag. Yeah, better to have the canopy in the graveyard than you in the graveyard. That sounds like <laughs> yeah, exactly, fucking, exactly. Fucking hell! But to be honest, to be honest, that's um, that's really changed me. Like you know, after that, um, nothing happened. I was fine. Like you know, I didn't break anything. It was just a just a really big scare. But um, the thing that before that I was. I always felt like, you know, that with my experience and, um, and you know, I can handle any situation. But I, when, on that jump, I was lucky. Hmm. And when I went for the next test jump after that, the next canopy was actually Petra. And I was still doing a few test jumps on, um, on Petra. But I was not really testing it. I was not really giving it a real go. I was sure. flying it. I was jumping it. I was landing it. But I was, I was scared. Sure. You know, by then. I could I could just not do what I was doing before. So yeah, I was like, okay, that's not for me anymore. Let's uh, let someone else do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I I would think with a situation like that, and I suppose uh, a lot of skydivers have it at some point. You have an incident like that that uh, kind of taps you on the shoulder and reminds you, hey, uh, this shit's for real, uh, and it could go badly. And it's uh, it's a reality check for me when you realize that luck actually does play a part in some of this stuff. And that's I don't like luck. <laughs> it makes me really nervous. Yeah, same. Yeah, yeah, yeah same. I, I same, same. Like no, that was. A- yeah, so like you, know, you can only be lucky so many times. Yes, yes, exactly. And eventually, you, you you can't help but think, all right, one of these times it's not going to work out quite as well. Yeah, the whole test pilot thing, man, that was just never my thing. <laughs> I'll leave that to to much bolder guys than me. So while I was doing it, I loved it. Like you know, I was part of something that. Uh, that like I always wondered like you know how did they get to this canopy how did they develop um you know um a stiletto how did they develop um the the, the VX and then uh, then the JVX and I was I was part of that that process mm. and my feedback after the jump like you know everybody was like I was designing they were listening to my feedback they watched the video and so I was part of the process of 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 making it better like you know prototype after prototype after prototype. So that was actually really like oh, I loved it. Sure. Um, so it was my thing while it lasted, but uh, then um, then yeah, like you know, it just came along and um, well, yeah, and like you know, you don't want to put it back. Yeah, I mean, eventually you just kind of got to go. Okay, yeah, that was good, but I mean, you've got children now and all that stuff, so that's got to play a part in it too. I mean, actually, actually, yeah, actually, my son, my son was on the drop zone then. Oh. So, he just watched everybody like you know being really scared and running around and you know so he scared him as well like. sure yeah i mean that had to play a huge part in the decision to back off a little bit because i mean as soon as the kids are involved and if he got scared because of something that dad's doing that's got to be a reality check yeah yeah so no yeah. what so but, you you went from that into your current position 
Now I was um, I was already general manager of um, of Aerosport, so I actually like to skip that part. So I started working there in '95, mm. making line sets and rigging. And back then the company was really small. We only made about six canopies in a week, and um, we had two sewing machinists. It was a small, really chilled lifestyle business. Sure, you know it was it was really nice. And um, <clears throat> the general manager um, had some um, family issues at the time, so he was away a little bit. Um, and he always gave me the phone, asked me to, you know, like to take an order to answer an email, to charge a credit card, to ship a canopy. So, and I, I was eager to learn about everything and anything. Mm. Um, and and I've only been there for maybe half a year. Then um, he said, sorry, like, no, I, I, I can't do the work right now any longer. And then Joro asked me if I want to do it. So I've only been there for, for half a year. And then, you know, I became manager <laughs> of the company. <laughs> that's kind of, that's oh. a hell of a tour. That's right. Yeah, I was um, I was at the right place at the right time. Mind you, it was a little bit different. So half of my time was still on production. I still cut all the canopies. Mm. I still did all the shipping and you know did some quality control by then. And taking the orders, emails, and um, just learning on um, learning on the fly. It was um, and then we started growing um, a little bit. Started in two thousand seven, two thousand eight. And then um, when we started developing new canopies and making a little bit noise around the world and uh, people started noticing us and that's when we really actually put an effort into into growing and uh, became the company that uh, we are today. Sure. Well, I mean, I can remember too, I, I think I had just started flying uh, Velocity uh, and all of a sudden there was this Icarus canopy out there that was starting to make some real noise and then it was Icarus this and Icarus that and it became this back and forth battle of uh, what are you on? You on a PD or you on an Icarus? Are you flying this or are you flying that? And that's when, uh, um, I mean that you guys must have just been over the moon thrilled because it, like I said, it's, oh, yeah. like, it's, it's those... 100%. I mean like you know, PD, PD always like, you know, PD always owned it. Like, you know, they had a, a back in the day, like, you know, there was Team Extreme, but that was like in in two thousand one, two, three, and then after that, you know, PD owned it. Um, we only had few canopies on competition. We always had some really talented, really good competitors. Like you know, there is Nick Badge. He was um he was just keep taking the the world records, the distance record. Sure. But there was not many not many competitors flying or canopies, and I look at it now, and it's a uh, and it's half half and. Yeah, exactly. We are thrilled to see that. Oh, yeah. No, it's um, it's amazing. Well, and and the fact of the matter is all the canopies that are being put out are, are they're fantastic canopies. Um, but, of course, they're always going to be measured by what the champions are doing. So if you guys are battling back and forth all the time for, for the podium with PD, that's pretty epic. Yes. They, yeah. And, I mean, like, you know, the competition, the swoop competition is the, is the best place to decide um you know what canopy flies you know how well for sure fly. For sure, absolutely. Well, and it's also very cool that in the realm of, of uh, um, sports, the most visible part of skydiving for most people nowadays is either guys flying down mountains in wingsuits or canopy stuff, because that's what spectators can see. Um, and it's it's uh, uh, yeah. just a you know an in your face uh, part of the sport, which is super cool. Yeah, like oh, I'm, I'm like you know when I watch these guys flying now. Uh, Today in um, in a competition, and the speed and the distance and it's just like <laughs> it's crazy. Amazing. Yeah, it's crazy, especially considering where you've come from in Hungary, flying round parachutes uh, at 16 years old. <laughs> You know, and now you're you're running the company that's putting out some of the most cutting edge canopies on the planet. It's that's a hell of a ride. That's right. Yeah, and um, yeah. Not the end of it. No, no, God, no. I, I'd say there's a lot more to come. Uh, speaking of which, uh, for those that are listening as we wrap things up, how do people uh, hop onto the website to find out more about the canopies, more about the company, and more about you? What is uh, NZ Aerosport's website? Yeah, you can go to nzaerosport.com or you can use canopies.com. 
and um, yeah, like I want to check out all the um, you know all the all the canopies, or uh, contact the team to live chat. Awesome, awesome. Now, do you guys uh, run a, an Instagram or a Facebook page as well? Yeah, that's that's right. Like you know the um, Anzadero Sports um, Icarus Canopies by Anzadero Sports is the um, is our um, Facebook page. Okay. Yeah, right. Like you know, there's, um, like we have lots of uh, world champions and uh, record holders, and um, yes, and, you do. You know, what what they do with the canopies is amazing. But uh, also, just for now, on Instagram, I see someone um someone posting about um being happy on about um receiving um a sapphire and um and putting a post up on um of the canopy still in the bag. Um it's just 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 cool thing to see. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Well and, and just seeing the the because uh, you've got such a wide range of canopies out there for all experience levels and it's gotta be very uh heartwarming to see how well received everything is and how much fun people are having with it. And hopefully COVID gives us all a break and we're all able to get out and enjoy the the air a hell of a lot more than we have been. Let's try to go strong again in 2021. Yeah, man. We'll see what happens. But Attila, I got to thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and talk to me and fill us in a little bit about uh, yourself and about uh, NZ Aerosports and Icarus. I really uh, appreciate the time. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care. Good talking. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Another episode of the Lunatic Fringe Podcast brought to you as always by, well, wait, not as always, actually. Brought to you now by Gyro. Formerly known as NZ Aerosports, you'll head to gyro.com for their next level line of canopies. By Pussfoot, the Extreme Sports Collective. Head over to pussfoot.com to check it out. By Summit Parachute Systems, check out summitparachutesystems.com to talk to Jarrett Martin and the gang about kick-ass pilot rigs, rigging courses, and more. By Flyaway Indoor Skydiving. Go to flyawaytn.com and check out all the cutting edge stuff to come. By Pure Spectrum CBD. Head to purespectrumcbd.com to check out their wide range of CBD products. And as for us, head to the lunaticfringepodcast.com to listen to any of the hundreds of episodes currently available. Hit the link for our YouTube channel, pick up your copy of the Lunatic Fringe book or the Accidental Stripper, and get a sneak peek at upcoming guests. Once again, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.